Did you guys get to see the eclipse down here? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Man, I was under a blanket of clouds up there in Grants Pass. It was, it was so tragic. It was just nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, was it pretty cool? Yeah. Was, yeah. The glasses were really yeah. see it. They really Excellent. Good. Nice. How many of you got to see it? Show of hands. Awesome. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, this is pretty rare. Um, I would take advantage when this comes up. There's going to be another one in April. I'm not sure if it's passing over Oregon or not. Um, on the 8th, I believe, of April. And that one's going to be even better. Really? Yeah, because, you know, the, the ability to really block the sky out depends on the location of the planet and its orbit. It also depends on the moon's distance, right? Remember, the moon is orbiting in an ellipse, so it's not always at the perfect distance to block out all the sun. The one that you guys saw was uh, still left a ring of light behind, right? And when you get really perfect alignments and really nice distances, you can block out the entire sky and it, it gets kind of nighttime-like. I don't know, how, did it get dark? No, no yeah. So the one in April is going to block out the sky completely, I believe. And that's a pretty epic experience, I, I, I think. Um, you know, and, and one thing I didn't really get to, to mention is just, I think that these eclipses were really monumental in organizing early civilizations and early societies because they, they, people had the ability to predict these things. Um, just because there's a pattern that appears, right? If you, if you keep charts long enough, you'll be able to see when these things happen. And as you can imagine, if you have the ability to predict when an eclipse is going to happen, um, that kind of gives you this almost mystical authority over, uh, over you know, the people that you're presiding over. Um, this is really interesting. I just wanted to read you this quote. So we don't have a lot of uh, information from Mesoamerica in terms of uh, records, which is a bit tragic, not because there weren't records kept, but because most of the records that persisted were in stone, and most of those stone monuments were just testimonies, it seems like, to, you know, it's kind of like if you see a statue to Abraham Lincoln or something, you're just going to kind of hear about the greatest hits. And uh, the Aztecs actually kept great libraries, but they, they kept them on something approximating paper, on some sort of parchment, and these were called codices. And of course, the Spanish, when they showed up, they, they burned all of these uh, immediately because, you know, competition for worldview and so forth. Uh, which is actually why we, we've lost a lot of history around the world in general. The, the winners always tend to eradicate the histories of those that they conquer. Um, but anyways, we have one codex from the Aztecs, and there's a little excerpt from this codex that I want to read you, which which is a description of what happened during some recent eclipse. Um, and it goes like this. The translation, anyway, says, When the eclipse came to pass, he, the sun, turned red. He became restless and troubled. He faltered and became very yellow. There was tumult and disorder. All were disquieted, unnerved, and frightened. There was weeping. The common folk raised a cry, lifting their voices, making a great din, calling out, shrieking. Shouting was everywhere. People of light complexion were slain as sacrifices. Captives were killed. All offered their blood. They drew straws through the lobes of their ears, which had been pierced. And in all the temples, there was singing and fitting chants. There was uproar. There were war cries. And it was thus said, If the eclipse of the sun is complete, it will be dark forever. The demons of darkness will come down, and they will eat men. Right, so there's this real participatory aspect, which was kind of coincides with the idea that, that people had this cosmology wherein the humans played an intricate role in supporting the cosmos above them, and that if they didn't do their part, it wouldn't keep going, which seems a bit superstitious on a surface shallow level view, but I think there's something to that, right? I think that there is a participatory aspect to keeping this whole machine going. And it, it, it's, it's uh, remember, cosmology used to mean something like our relationship to the world and to nature. And uh, I don't know, that's, that's, that's something to really consider. Um, there's also a really interesting story, uh, which I, I guess I didn't, I thought I had the quote from, but I, I left it out, which is uh, when 
Colum uh, Christopher Columbus showed up in, in Haiti, modern Haiti. Uh, he had a really hard time convincing the tribes there to work with him at first. And at some point, he, uh, he had knowledge of an eclipse that was going to happen. And he, he made a bet, something like, you know, you guys are going to work for me uh, because if you don't, I'm, I'm going to like call on the gods to blot out the sky tomorrow, uh, the, the moon tomorrow night. I think it was a, a lunar eclipse, which is when, of course, the Earth's shadow passes over the moon. And, of course, it did come to pass, and uh, the, the legend goes, or at least the history told, is that they, they sort of laid down their arms and surrendered to him at that point. So very powerful. The ability to predict seems to be, and it's still it's very powerful. Um, if you look at the authority, if you look at the, the place of science in our civilization, you know, the, the politicians um, historically have looked to the scientists as the ones who are able to sort of divine the future and imagine what's going to happen. And of course, they've been increasingly subjugated under the, the paradigm of what the government is interested in, um, which oftentimes, unfortunately, has been defense-related or, or product development-oriented in terms of pharmaceuticals and so forth. But there's something to that. There's something, uh, there's something really powerful about being able to understand what's going to happen in the future. This is really important to humanity. Anybody have any other like, questions or comments about eclipses before I ditch that, move on? All right, so our, our journey now is, is going to, we're going to, by the end of this week, we're going to start moving into the different bodies in the solar system. But before that, we have to understand how telescopes work. And of course, telescopes have grown increasingly complex, and there's a number of different configurations that we use. There's two basic types that you'll probably be familiar with, and if you do end up going to this event or have the chance to look through a telescope at any point, you'll almost certainly um, be looking at visible light. But of course, most of the astronomy that's done today is looking at other wavelengths of light. So I think it's really important for us to spend some time thinking about light itself. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was coming up through college and, well, well way, way before that, um, I was a bit troubled by light as a phenomenon because it's, uh, in some sense, it's absolutely primary to our everyday existence. Uh, it, it's how we navigate the world. It's how we think, really, in terms of visualization. But at the same time, finding a physical basis for it and really understanding what's going on is... Uh, Something that's, I think, increasingly neglected. And, and actually, my wife and I are working on, on a book about the, the loss of physical mediators in physics. And, and it's very, there's some very interesting things that happen, and I think they reflect some changes in the society, and I want to explore those with you a little bit today. Because I feel like if we don't have a grip on what light is, it's going to be very difficult to understand how we're able to utilize it to make sense of what's happening very far away. Because ultimately, all we have in astronomy is light, right? And that's, in some sense, very, very unique and difficult among the sciences. In almost every other science, we can put something under, you know, in a lab dish. We can do little experiments. But you can't do that in astronomy. You can just look up and make sense of what you see. And if all you see is light, and you don't understand light, then you're going to come to all sorts of bizarre conclusions. And there's kind of a rich history of that having happened in the last 200 years. There's a number of bizarre conclusions that have resulted, and I think a lot of those come from a misunderstanding of light. Now, I don't purport to have the answers for exactly what's going on with light, but I think that I do have some insight. It's kind of funny I say insight, right? Because this is the way that we think. We can't actually think without using the word light. It's so central to our, to our, our operation. So... We're going to take a look at light and try to make some sense of it. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, we can get into the very early history of, well, the mo early modern history of telescopes and spectroscopy, which is this art of splitting light into its component wavelengths so that you can make different inferences about the composition of the different bodies and their atmospheres and all of this, which will be kind of assuming to be the case as we go forward, right? As we talk about these different bodies in the solar system, you know, many of them 
we've sort of visited, maybe we've flown by some of them, but a lot of the information is just coming from light. Now, you're probably not accustomed to thinking about things like radio waves and x-rays as light, but they are light. They're, they're really the same process and they obey the same dynamics. And so we need to be thinking about all of these phenomena in terms of light. All right. So we'll do light, we'll do spectroscopy, and hopefully we'll get to telescopes, but if not, we'll do more of that next time. So, you know, today we have, uh, we have a very um, Aristotelian conception of light, which is, which is kind of funny, um, because the, there was actually a, a very enlightened moment. I would say that there's been a few really, really brilliant periods in Western history. One of them was the ancient Greeks, the other one was the Enlightenment, and uh, maybe another one was like the 19th century, where there was a lot, there was a free market of ideas, there was a lot of people discussing possibilities of what was happening, and, and the ancient Greeks were kind of really the first to start considering material conceptions of what's going on, and of course they came up with the idea of the atom. And so their thinking about, about light was, was more material in some sense than ours today. And uh, one of the first people to write about that was uh, Lucretius, who was this, uh, he, was, he was building on the tradition of the Greeks. He was actually in Rome. Um, and he wrote, uh, here's a quote from Lucretius. Uh, the light and heat of the sun, these are composed of minute atoms, which when they're shoved off, lose no time in shooting right across the interspace of air in the direction imparted by the shove. And so this is really the first germ of the idea that light was these little bullets, which makes a lot of sense because it, Light propagates in these rays, right? I think we talked about this a little bit with like the uh, CGI animations that, that depend on ray tracing in order to calculate all of the beautiful reflections that give you those realistic images that you see in movies and animations. So light has this ray-like quality, and this is one of the first things that people realized. And so, of course, it was natural to people building on this material representation of reality that it should be some sort of thing, some sort of material body which is being projected. And, you know, that idea, that idea got lost um, in the Dark Ages, which stretched for about 1,500 years. This is really interesting because during the Dark Ages, it became more popular to think of the physical universe as being populated by something like spirits. They would call them uh, like these forces of nature, right? Like wind, fire, earth. And I'm going to make the case to you that this is actually a lot closer to how we look at physics today. Well, maybe not all of us, but how, how modern physics is structured in terms of these forces and these almost mystical processes that are kind of beyond comprehension. You know, we can detail their dynamics with, with absolutely stunning precision but the actual material representation of what hap what's happening um, seems to be receding in some sense in the similar way that it did during the Dark Ages, which is a little bit troubling to me. And this is kind of the, the topic of the book that I've been uh, really uh, sweating over for, for several years now. And, and um, in some sense, I think it's actually really important that we work our way back to a material representation uh, of physics to parallel our schematic representation, which is captured by all these wonderful equations. Actually, it seems to me when I walked into the room today, somebody, I guess, in the chemistry lecture hall was talking about the different uh, mathematics of light transmission and so forth. And um, of course, those are really valuable in terms of producing technology. But um, it seems like we've, in some sense, gotten further away from understanding what's actually happening. Now, this idea that the, the Greeks had, well, I guess the, the Romans really advanced uh, that light was these little bullets was in some sense uh, resurrected later on in, by the, the Enlightenment thinkers. Um, it seems like Rene Descartes, you guys have heard of Descartes because he came up with these Cartesian coordinates that you use in math, right? This X, Y axis business. But Descartes was actually just a complete baller. He, he touched on everything from mechanics to uh, the duality problem of the mind and body he was a great mathematician as well. 
Um, it's very interesting when you go back and look at these Enlightenment thinkers because these are the people that pulled us out of the Dark Ages. And, and what's really, really stunning about the, this, these groups of people from the Enlightenment was that they, they, in some sense, were very different than our intellectuals today. They weren't specialists in any, in any way. Each one of these people uh, that really moved the needle and, and dragged us out of this mystical Dark Ages that, again, stretched for more than a thousand years, after the fall of the Roman Empire, they, they were all very interested in lots of different topics. And I think that their ability to, to investigate multiple different arms of nature at once really led to this cross-pollination where they're able to see things in a new light. And, and in some sense, I feel like we would, we're, we're a bit plagued by our, our myopicness today in that if you do pursue a scientific career, you, you're very likely, if you follow the pipeline as presented to you, to end up studying one little thing very intensely for the rest of your career. And while that's very useful in advancing you know, the next iPhone, it's not necessarily the best way to get new fundamental conceptions of, how, of nature and how all of these different interconnected systems play together. So I think we can learn a lot from these people by studying the Enlightenment thinkers. Now, Descartes actually resurrected this idea of the little bullet of light that was flying. He's, he called it the corpuscular idea. And um, he actually got this idea from a friend. Um, and I, I can't recall the guy's name. I think it was Beaker or Beekman, maybe. And Beekman was an interesting fellow because he didn't create any works of his own. He, he was just sort of this little angel that whispered in the ears of the people who were actually writing at the time. And I think there's actually a, a really important role for people like this, even in the modern landscape, people who are sort of outside of the publishing sphere but are, are sort of dancing around with ideas who don't really want to champion them themselves. At any rate, uh, Descartes very publicly denounced the uh, the forms I, that, that these patterns, these mystical entities were capable of producing phenomena, and, and he was really interested in the material representation of that. And there was, of course, a number of Enlightenment thinkers that championed the, those old ideas, um, including Bacon and Kepler, right? As we talked about Kepler a bit. Um, you know, and we talked about Newton when we were talking about the, the planetary law, like how gravitation unfolded. And, and, and the people who worked on gravitation and other invisible processes just like light had varying degrees uh, of recognition that, of what they were doing and whether what they were doing was in fact an explanation or whether it was actually something more like a description of what was happening. Because remember, describing what's happening is very different than explaining what's happening, right? You can tell me if I'm a magician on a stage sawing a lady in half, you can tell me what it looked like and you can be very accurate, but that doesn't mean that I actually saw the lady in half, right? They're very different ideas. The cause and the effect are very different presentations than just the description of the process happening. And of course, what we do today and what's, what's most technologically useful today is those very highly refined descriptions of what's happening. That's how you, that's how you make technology, right? You want to design a wing that, that gives better lift, you parameterize it, you know, in terms of its its shape and its, its architecture and the flow dynamics, and you put those into equations, and you can tinker with little aspects, the variables in the equation, and you can refine your design. Now, that doesn't mean you understand anything about the physical processes that are happening. You don't necessarily have to understand that, you know, there's air molecules that are being displaced and, and so forth. Of course, people were able to build incredible technologies before they had any idea of what an air molecule was. So these things have been, there's sort of a war going on below the surface of people who are concerned with what's happening versus people who are concerned with what to do about it. And of course, we live in a, in a very technological era that's, that's primarily driven by what to do, right? What can we make of, of what we understand? And that's all well and good, but it, it's not the whole story. And I think there's, there's something there's something sublime about actually understanding how things work that doesn't get accounted for in economics. So Descartes sort of threw this idea at the wall that there was these, these little uh, corpuscles. Um, Newton seems to have taken this up. Descartes never fa finished a manuscript on light. He was working on one at the time of his death. And uh, Newton picked that up. Now, 
it was seriously entertained for maybe 100 years after Newton, but uh, very, very soon thereafter, people started examining this strange behavior called diffraction, which we'll talk about a bit when it comes to spectroscopy. And diffraction's uh, a real mess because ultimately what you have is, and, and this is encountered uh, in various famous ideas like the double slit experiment, maybe you've heard of this, right, where these photons appear to travel through two slits at once and so forth. But what actually happens, and I wish I could do a demonstration for you, but if you have a very thin slit, let's say, or you can just do this with a knife blade too, if you pass a very collimated beam of light like a, a laser across that, what you'll have happen is that the light isn't simply divided across the, the knife edge, it, it actually seems to ca cast these, uh, these bands of brightness, right? And actually, in some sense, it casts bands of darkness into the shadowed regions if you have a slit, right? So you have a, a screen with a slit, you cast a, a light across it, and you actually see these bands of lightness and darkness. It's very strange that you would be able to sort of reflect shadows into the light regions. That's one of the more perplexing re ideas behind it. Well, at any rate, people very quickly realized that the only way you could explain this is if light was, was essentially behaving as a wave. Because you can do this with a, a bucket of water. You can make these slits and see how these waves interfere with one another. Of course, you have the, the peak of the wave and the trough of the wave, and if you have you know, a peak coincide with a trough, it nullifies it, right? There's just no motion there all of a sudden. So diffraction experiments uh, like this sort of solidified the idea that light must be a wave. Now, this, this became very popular and technologically useful. A lot of the guys that were working on, uh, here's a nice picture of it, actually. Um, as you can see, so you, you let little uh, waves through at different slits over here, and you see how they interfere. And this became really useful. These diffraction gratings were, were useful in terms of orienting light. People used them for making uh, lighthouses, so you could see ships in the fog, at or so ships could navigate at, at, in the fog and at night. And um, so it had great technological use at the same time. But the problem was, this is very difficult to rectify uh, with the corpuscular idea. How does a little bullet interfere with itself? How does a bullet behave in a wave-like fashion? And, you know, you might say, well, sound is, is, uh, is, can essentially be thought of in a sort of corpuscular sense. I mean, you're not shooting little bullets of air when you speak towards someone, but you are vibrating the air, and it is in a wave-like fashion. And in some sense, you can get interference with sound. But uh, a number of experiments led to the understanding, which I, I won't bore you with, but led to the understanding that actually the light waves themselves were not this simple longitudinal compression like with sound. So when you speak, you know, you compress the air in front of you and then it relaxes and this sort of propagates across the room so that you can hear me. But in light, you actually have a different kind of deformation of some sort. You actually have a transverse oscillation, which really means that it's something more torsional. It's twisting, actually. And this is perplexing because, again, how do you have little bullets that cause some sort of twisting interference at their uh, detector and at their emitting source? And, um, you know, I, I don't think this has been totally untangled to this point. Um, however, uh, people made increasingly progressive uh, iterations on the mathematics of this to the point that people were able to come to understand, in particular, the, the work of those 19th century scientists, the, the electromagneticians, let's say, like Michael Faraday and, um, and Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell. They were able to refine the mathematics and they did some experimentation and, and they, they came to realize that, uh, amongst other things, that different wavelengths had uh, different energies to them, and that these, the light could be split into its component wavelengths through this diffraction process. And they came to realize that, that light had electromagnetic properties. The, the way that that was actually done is maybe worth, worth noting. Um, 
uh, and the, the output, of course, is that light is this, is, can be thought of as transmitting an impulse that both had electric and magnetic properties, right? And those property, those, those effects that were received, right? So I'm still talking in terms of light's effects. That's really all we have, these observations of the effects. At the receiver, we notice that the electric properties are always at a right angle to the magnetic properties. Um, and so, you know, how, how they figured this out was kind of cool. There was this uh, general, gentleman named Heinrich Hertz, and Hertz set up this experiment um, where he essentially was able to, gen he made a little electric circuit where he was able to have this oscillating current that generated this spark that was going back and forth in polarity across this little gap. And what he realized was that if he set this another loop of wire on the other side of the room, he was able to transmit that spark to the, to the other wire. And so he realized that there was something inherently electric or magnetic about this process of light. And, and the mathematics were refined through experimentation to the point that they realized that the, the electromagnetic impulse was being transmitted and that it was inseparable. Now, that doesn't necessarily get us any closer to understanding what's happening in the space in between the two, although it seems to have uh, become less and less important because, of course, it was in some sense very paradoxical, right? Because still, light is traveling in this beam-like fashion in some sense. It, it travels in rays, which we could say uh, it propagates rectilinearly, that is, goes straight, right? Which is very strange. But it also goes, uh, it has this wave-like property. It's able to oscillate the, the detector, let's say that coil in, in Hertz's experiment, in this, in this way that generates essentially an alternating current in its source, back and forth, back and forth. And this is that torsional aspect to the transverse wave that you hear about. This is all very perplexing. So people essentially sometime uh, around the, the 1800s, um, well, late 1800s, they, they kind of moved on from it. And you might think, well, well, there's more to that story. So they, they didn't really just move on from it. So uh, most people, in terms of making sense of gravitation after Newton, and in terms of making sense of light and electricity, they, they presumed that there must be some all-pervading fluid that, that was everywhere, and it was spanned the distance in between bodies like ourselves right now and that vibrations in this fluid, which they called the luminiferous ether, were able to host light. So light was essentially vibrations in this fluid, which is um, you know, maybe a, a little bit half-baked, but it's, a, it's a, actually a reasonable proposal. I mean, we must, this impulse must be transmitted somehow, right? And there must be, uh, at least according to the rationalists, there must be some cause of that effect, some material basis for it. But like I said, there's, there's two warring, there's always been two warring philosophies in science. There's these rationalists who say, well, we can't really detect this ether stuff, but we know it must be there, and therefore it's sufficient for us to assume its presence. This is called a hypothesis. And then there's the empiricists who say, we're not gonna worry about that. All we're gonna worry about is the observations we can make. If we can observe something, we'll detail that observation and we'll move forward with our observations. We'll construct mathematical models of the observations. And, you know, it's quite clear where we stand today. We're definitely an empirical science civilization today. In large part, like I said, because empiricism is so important to the development of technology. But the rationalists got pushed out of the building in some point towards the late uh, 1800s, and I think this was in large part because there was a great effort to detect this luminiferous ether. Everybody wanted to find it. Right? They wanted to be able to characterize it, and so they set up some experiments to detect it. Uh, a number of people were working on this, but most famously, uh, uh, some, of the, the great, uh, infer the, uh, some of the great experimenters um, came up with this idea of inferometers, right? where they would essentially set up these two mirrors. And this is actually the basic process they, they've used for these gravitational wave experiments. But you essentially have a beam of light, you split it, you send it to two mirrors. And the, the light has a, a characteristic wavelength for these pulsations. And as, uh, if there's any changes in, say, the length of those arms or 
as the etherists were hoping that the light would, you know, if it was, if the earth was moving through the ether, well, it should be faster, the light should be faster in one direction because, you know, the ether's sort of dragging behind it and it'll be slower in one direction. So they figured they'd be able to detect this drag through this inferometer experiment. And they couldn't do it, right? They could not detect any appreciable, well, there was, you know, lots of reports. Some people reported a little bit of drag. Some people reported a lot of drag. Some people reported no drag. And a couple of the most famous uh, inferometer scientists of the day uh, made this landmark paper. It's called the Michelson-Morley experiment. And they reported no drag whatsoever. And it was kind of conclusive. You know, this is enough of these papers accumulated to the point where people said, this is, this is a failed endeavor. We're not going to be able to detect this stuff. So what's very interesting to me is that at this point, people essentially moved on, right? The empiricists were the ones who were able to actually come up with usable mathematical theories. And those were, you know, in some sense, actionable. And the rationalists didn't have a clue. They really didn't know what to say. They, it, why couldn't this ether be detected? They didn't know, actually. And, you know, I don't think, uh, even up through Einstein's day, that people, scientists working on light and gravity like Einstein was, I don't think that they entirely abandoned the realization that something must be mediating these effects. You know, Einstein called his space-time concoction something like a non-kinematic ether, which really meant that it was just something that you couldn't touch, but it was there and it was mediating effects and that it actually changed, that the con construction, the structure of that ether changed with the presence of different bodies of different masses and so forth. And, you know, in some sense, I think Einstein's uh, space-time idea it can be considered uh, an actual ether. It's just, I think what happened is that the primary, I think there was one little mistake that was made, which was that people assumed that that ether was separate from the actual atoms that were floating in it. They had this idea that the atoms were made of something, the ether was made of something else, and that as the atoms moved through it, they should, there should be interactions between the two that were detectable, right? It's sort of like a ship sailing on, on water, or maybe, I don't know, uh, Cheerios floating in a bowl of milk. The, the milk should be separate, and you should be able to detect that. Um, but I, I, think that, I think that actually something, if I can make a prediction about the next 100 years, that if the rationalists are allowed back in the building, I think that the new conception uh, will be something more close to the idea that the atoms themselves are constructed of the same material that the, 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 the rarefied portions of them in between are constructed of. This gets into a new realm where the atoms are actually able to carry their own uh, external material with them. And so, of course, you're not going to detect anything separate from them. You know, that's, that's just a hypothesis, of course. And I think that that can be substantiated even further because I showed you this very similar diagram when we talked about gravity, which I think is really, really fascinating. So both light and gravity fall off with an inverse square. The intensity of gravity, let's say, the force of gravity, as Newton would call it, or the intensity of light, they both fall off with an inverse square, which, you know, people haven't really uh, illustrated very much in terms of gravity, but I showed you a similar diagram, which makes a lot of sense. And I, I said to you, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about gravity. You can think about it as, uh, as Newton's forces. You can think about it as Einstein's warped space-time. But another way to think about it is in the vein of these Persian scholars who considered that basically all of the bodies were connected by these invisible cords to one another, right? Now, light can also be kind of thought of as a transmission along cords, right? And this is illustrated in the inverse square law, right? So as you can see, when you're very close to an object, like you take a square region, right? A little, an area of a sphere, a square uh, pattern. And you can see that there's four rays of light going when it's very, when it's say at some distance D, right? But as you move, say out to a distance twice as much, you only have a quarter of, of those rays going through. Uh, or, or another way to think about it is in the four times the area, you have the same number of rays. Then you go out even further to three times the distance, and in nine times the area, you only have four rays going through it. Well, it's the same thing with gravity, right? There's something ray-like 
about the interaction between atoms with light and with gravity, which I think will be really instrumental in people uh, and the rationalists making sense of what's going on materially between these atoms. Um, it brings me to, to another point, which is uh, I, I've had the, the real supreme joy of getting to know this gentleman over the last few years. And he's a, he's a wonderful uh, Caltech emeritus professor named Carver Mead. And he worked with Richard Feynman at Caltech. Um, Feynman, of, of course, is one of the absolute titans of physics. If, you, uh, if you're in any way interested in physics and want to learn more, he has, uh, you can read all of his lectures that he gave um, there at Caltech. And they're, they're very instrumental. They're essentially the best version of an intro physics class that you'll ever find. Uh, and anyways, Carver, Carver, uh, Carver has this really interesting idea, and he's, he's really resurrected an even older idea, that most physicists have, have come to think about light in terms of this thing that is emitted from atoms, and that's the end of the story. And, and Carver has built a, uh, a reconception of electromagnetics and electrodynamics, which is really the most cutting-edge quantum field theory for how we can understand the behavior of electromagnetic systems. <clears throat> and what he'd noticed is that there's no such thing as light without two atoms involved, right? And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind. He, he found that mathematically, light is really a conversation between two atoms. There's some sort of transaction that's occurring. And of course, if you go back and look at the history, like I was talking about with Hertz, that's extremely apparent, right? There's something happening on one side of the room that is evidenced on the other side of the room. And of course, all of our telescopes depend on this. Our ability to see depends on this. There's something happening over there that I'm able to detect with my eyes, my detectors over here. And so there's something, some conversation happening amongst the atoms in between those. I put this quote up here uh, from G.N. Lewis. Now, you might have heard of G.N. Lewis because he's the person who gave us the idea of the chemical bond, essentially. You think of Lewis pairing from chemistry and so forth. And uh, Lewis made this little note in the side of one of his papers that was lost, I think, for uh, almost 100 years. And I'm going to read it to you because I think it's absolutely ingenious. I'm going to make the contrary assumption that an atom never emits light except to another atom. I propose to eliminate the idea of mere emission of light and substitute the idea of transmission or a process of exchange of energy between two definite atoms. Both atoms must play coordinate and symmetrical parts in the process of the exchange. And I just think this is absolutely revolutionary because, you know, if you, I don't know if you guys will end up taking basic physics or, or maybe you did in high school, but you will almost never see light treated as this transactional process. And I think that this does a great disservice if we look at that inverse square law and we think about it not in terms of light, but we think about it in terms of gravity, we of course understand that those atoms are pulling on one another. Gravity doesn't make sense without two bodies with different masses that are able to interact, right? So light has to be thought of the same way. And I actually think it's, it's increasingly and stunning to me how, how similar but opposite light and gravity are. Um, there's more to that. So, I mentioned these gravitational wave uh, experiments. Maybe you guys have seen these in, in the news lately. And the data is very uh, noisy and rudimentary, and there, there hasn't been a great deal uh, of, of observations logged about gravitational waves because gravitational waves um, are inherently extremely weak. Well, gravity itself is extremely weak, actually. It's, it's uh, by far the weakest of all of these mystical forces that are proposed to hold the world together. It's, uh, it's orders and orders of magnitude weaker than electromagnetism, for instance, and it's much weaker than all of the other forces. So detecting uh, gravitational disturbances in terms of this wave-like nature is very difficult to do. But it follows mathematically that there should be waves as a result of bodies interacting. Now what's really interesting about gravitational waves is you might think, okay, most waves that we encounter in the world are, are these nice longitudinal waves like sound, like we say, or, or waves um, of compression. But actually, gravitational waves, just like light, are, are also transverse processes. There's something torsional about them, right? There's something that inflicts this, this back and forth behavior. 
Gravitational waves also travel just like light at a constant speed, and they travel at the same constant speed. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at to you is that there seems to be some inherent interplay between light and gravity. They propagate in the same way. They almost certainly propagate in the same mechanical fashion using the same connections. And, um, you know, there, there's just not a lot of work going on about this right now. And it's unlikely that that kind of work is going to come from people inside of the deep nitty gritties of electric, electric dynamics, right? Because those processes, like I said, everyone is very specialized today. People are not really working on light and electricity are not the same people working on gravitation, right? There's not a lot of overlap. And so I imagine whether it takes 100 years or another 1,000 years that at some point we'll see a lot of interplay when, when people are, are able to, to engage in a more free market of ideas and they're exploring lots of different disciplines at once. But there's something really uncanny about the overlap of light and gravity. And uh, I don't think that it's wise to think about one without thinking about the other to some extent. All right. You know, Lewis also, by the way, came up with, he coined the term photon for the smallest units of radiant energy. And um, that turned out to play a big role, which we'll get to in a minute, with the uh, characterization of the photon and, and all of that, which came about in the early 20th century. So, you know, light was increasingly recognized to occur across this entire spectrum. I, I hinted at this at the beginning of the talk today. All of these different, uh, all of these different, you know, wavelengths constitute portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is quite interesting. So, you know, X-rays, gamma rays, and of course, the uh, all the way out to the radio waves. Now, these are really, really high energy waves down here, right? That means there's a lot of oscillations per unit time going on. In fact, there's so many oscillations per unit time uh, with these, these gamma rays, for instance, that they'll, they'll absolutely interact with the atoms of your body and not in a very pleasant way, right? So if you hear about things like the, the fallout from nuclear bombs and so forth, right? These, radi these nuclear disasters at power plants, which have been actually fairly few and far between. Um, those are actually light interactions. Um, in some sense, you, you, there, are, there, is, there are other nuclear um, problems, right? There's different, uh, let's say, call them particles for now. There's different particles, uh, high energy particles that will mess with your body too. But light itself can really shake your atoms apart, particularly your DNA. And you don't want your DNA shaken apart. That's not gonna be good for your long-term survival. So, uh, and of course, the radio signals are quite useful to us too, uh, if you haven't noticed. We're all using them right now uh, to, you know, people who are online right now or, or using Wi-Fi, your cell phones, all of this. They all depend on light. And light has different levels of penetration, which is also quite interesting. So these really high energy uh, waves, let's say very, very high, uh, intensely um, oscillatory processes, they can penetrate through materials. And, um, you know, there's not a ton of consideration that goes on in terms of what exactly does that mean. But, you know, I would submit to you that it seems like light is something of a relay process. So, when I'm looking at someone in the, in the back of the room right now, uh, it's unlikely that, well, it's impossible that I am actually connecting my atoms directly with the atoms in your, in your eyes at the back of the room for the mere fact that there's a lot of air in between us, right? <clears throat> and so it seems that certain atoms have the ability to transmit light as soon as they receive that impulse, however that's affected, and, and forward it on to the atom in front of them, and so on and so forth. And there's different degrees by which atoms can do this. And of course, the intensity of light and the wavelength, how much energy is in those oscillations, has a lot to do with it. So, you know, if I was to turn on a beam of, of x-rays right now, I could, I could easily relay that signal right through the wall and I could see what's happening in the hallway back there, right? And uh, this is quite useful in medical imaging. Now, radio waves, they're a lot, they have a lot less energy and, and that, that turns out to be a real big problem because it's actually quite difficult for us to get uh, you know, signals through the walls um, 
Now, it is possible, but if you have a very thick wall, it's impossible. In fact, if you guys have probably noticed, if you're on a road trip or something and you go down in a valley, you might lose cell phone uh, signal, right? <clears throat> because that light's not able to be transmitted through those mountains. It's not, these bodies are not able to, to transmit in a resonant fashion that energy to your, your, your cell phone. Okay, so there's different degrees of penetration with each of these wavelengths and different energies. And that's really important in terms of understanding light, I think. Um, you know, there's, there's another, well, we'll get to that in a second. So what's the basic idea for, so, so the empiricists rule the day, and, and how do the empiricists come to describe the atom, and how do they describe the production of light? Um, well, it's actually not too far off from a rational perspective. They understand that the atom, um, this is essentially a schematic uh, uh, version of the atom, which isn't, uh, it isn't totally useless. It's, it's over 100 years old, and you probably find it in most of your textbooks because it's, it's quite effective in describing what's happening. But let me just lay out the empirical view for you. So the idea is that the atom, the outer surface of the atom, let's say, is something This uh, is qualified by this process called the electron. And the electron is in different states of energy, right? It's, it's vibrating somehow. It's in a frenetic motion of some sort. And there's different degrees of that. And when the electron changes energy states, let's say when it relaxes from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it is able to emit light, or at least it is able to un undergo that transaction with another atom, right? And so the cool thing is that each one of these energy states that it relaxes from has a different wavelength of light that it gives off. And so we can learn about how excited these atoms are by looking at their wavelength. And of course, each element has its own characteristic fingerprint of these different energy states, which owes to, of course, the different architecture, ultimately, of the atoms that comprise each element in the periodic table, or different molecules, let's say, which are just aggregates of those different elements. And so this basic idea, uh, in some sense, it makes a lot of sense from a rational perspective. The atom is in, in some state of vibration. Its surface is, is changing, and as it relaxes, it undergoes that dissipation with its environment, with other atoms, through the process of light. Now, this, of course, like I said, allowed people to identify by the fingerprints of those different wavelengths what elements were going on. And that's going to prove really important in terms of understanding the stars and the planets in a second. <clears throat> but there was, there's more to this story. <clears throat> this process is most evident in individual elements or in gases, right? So gases are wonderful because they're simple. They're just free atoms, let's say, or maybe they're one or two atoms that are linked together in some sort of covalent bond. But they don't have a lot of different ways they can vibrate. If I take a sphere, <clears throat> how many ways can you vibrate a sphere? Well, it's quite limited, actually. You know, you can squish it up and down, maybe it can jiggle in some sideways fashion, but it doesn't have a lot of, what we would say, oscillatory degrees of freedom, right? And the result of that is that gases give you individual frequencies of light when they go through these energy transitions. But solid bodies, like the one I'm sitting on, or like your body, <clears throat> solid bodies do something really different. Solid bodies, give off a continuous rainbow of colors, actually, when they're heated, okay? And so this is a really important piece of the puzzle because people began studying the actual spectra that were produced from heating different bodies to different temperatures. Um, in particular, uh, this gentleman, Gustav Kirchhoff, was uh, really, really instrumental in terms of characterizing how these processes uh, played out in material bodies that were heated. And he worked a lot with this guy Bunsen, who you probably know from the Bunsen burner. And they spent a lot of time burning different elements and characterizing you know, how these spectra resulted. So on one hand, they were studying the gases and the elements and how these individual lines could be produced. And on the other hand, they're studying how when they heat different bodies to different temperatures, how that changes the spectral profile. So this is just all of the different wavelengths that are being emitted, but you can see there's a peak wavelength here, actually. One, one wavelength where most of the intensity of the source 
coming back is. And, you know, people played with this a lot, and, and this gentleman named Ween came along and actually realized that the wavelength and temperature were in some sense related, right? And he came up with a law to describe that, which I've posted there for you. And it essentially says that in these heated bodies, that the peak emission uh, wavelength was, was in some sense related to temperature by this constant of proportionality called Wien's displacement constant. And this actually allowed people to make, for the first time, estimates of the temperature of different stars in the sky by the color, right? Because from that wavelength, which of course you can get, which we call color, right, qualitatively, you can actually tell the temperature, uh, at least the effective temperature, the perceived temperature of these stars. So this was, this was a really brilliant insight. Now there is some trouble with this, actually. <clears throat> so um, the problem was that people began to realize that, that temperature and wavelength were related, and of course energy and wavelength were related. And, and the problem was that it was expected, like I showed you, that those really uh, short wavelengths would have really, really high energy, as they do. As we know, X-rays and gamma rays can be very damaging. They're very high energy. But the problem was that people suspected, prior to these experimentations, that that energy would essentially go to infinity at some point, right? That the, as you decrease the wavelength, that the energy would just keep going up. These would be incredibly powerful, and at some point, you would just have infinite energy at this really high frequency light. But as the study with black bodies showed, <clears throat> this wasn't the case. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the energy appeared to drop off um, precipitously. And this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe at the time because people expected that the, the energy of, of ultraviolet light would, would be much larger, but in fact it, it was less in some sense per unit intensity. And so the way that they solved this was mathematically this guy named Planck came along and Planck took up in some sense this idea of the photon and realized that if light could only be delivered in individual units, that the mathematics would rearrange itself in such a way that you wouldn't have this expectation of infinite energy at these high frequencies. Now, this, of course, was a real disaster because all of a sudden we thought we had this wave understanding of light, but all of a sudden, oh my God, we're back to thinking about light as these individual little bullet particles. And again, <clears throat> how do the little bullet particles cause wave interference? It's a complete disaster, um, but it's a new disaster. It's a different disaster than the ultraviolet disaster. And, um, well, I think that maybe some insight into the solution to that, that disaster is what Planck actually called those units. He didn't call them photons, he called them the quanta of action. So it's sort of like the least amount of action necessary to engage a light signal between two atoms. So there seems to be, you know, and, and I think we encounter this all the time, right? If you, uh, let's say you get in a car and you, you have a gear shift, if you kind of pull on the gear shift a little bit, nothing happens. Pull a little bit harder, nothing happens. A little bit harder, nothing happens. And then finally, boom, you can knock it into the next gear, right? And I think there's a lot of processes that are stepwise like this. And um, in terms of the vibration of the atom too, I think this is reasonable as well, right? <clears throat> why, does, uh, why does something take on a particular, uh, have you guys ever seen these, uh, I forget they're called, like quadri plates or something? Have you seen this experiment where people hook up a speaker to like put some sand or paint on top of it and you get these different designs that appear, right? But what's really interesting is that they're very quantized designs, right? As you change the frequency of the impulse, at some point the shape that's appearing on top of the vibrating surface, it has one geometric pattern and then you change the frequency and it just goes into chaos for a little bit and then transitions into a new pattern because there are different stable vibrations that happen, right? These are, there's different resonant structures that appear. And I think that the atom is probably no different than that. There's different stable conformations of the surface of the atom, that electron surface, that are possible. And so you can put a lot of energy into the surface of an atom before it's going to be able to kick into, it's going to be ripped loose into a new state of vibration that's stable. And there's going to be some chaos in between. 
And I think that the transaction of light has to do with negotiating that chaos and getting into those different stable confirmations. So the quantum of action is really at the heart of what a photon is and why we think about it in terms of these discrete uh, bumps. All right, so Kirchhoff really laid out the basic principles of us for modern astronomy. And these are often referred to as Kirchhoff's laws. And, and they're really, really important. And they're really important next semester as we talk about stars and, and what, how stars function and how they generate light and so forth. And there's, there's actually a fair amount of cutting edge debates about the interpretation of these laws. Because what's really important to remember is that all of Kirchhoff's work was done in one of two forms. First, looking at gases, right? These individual line frequencies that would come out from a different element, say as it was burned with Bunsen and so forth. Or he looked at the heating of these material bodies. Now, he didn't just take any material and heat it up, although he may as well have. But what he did was he found that the best, the best examples of this were these soot-covered objects. He called them black bodies, right? So what he'd do is he'd, he'd heat something up and stick it inside of this box, which was coated in soot, a carbonized sort of uh, a chamber. And that, that blackened chamber would, at some point, come to equilibrium with the heated body inside of it. And the radiation from the outside could be spectrally analyzed. They would put a prism in front of it, something to split up the different wavelengths. And that's how they would generate these nice curves. But it's really, really interesting that he chose that, that graphite uh, soot as the perfect black body, right? The perfect example uh, of, his, uh, of this quality, this, this continuous spectrum that we see in heated solid bodies. Now, he also found that this, this could be the case for liquids as well. But interestingly enough, he never, ever was able to see this continuous black body spectrum produced from a gas. And you might think, why am I going on about this? Who cares? The interesting thing is that perhaps what you've learned if in high school is that our sun is a burning ball of gas, right? I don't know, maybe you've heard this. I don't know if they're still saying this in school. But in some sense, this doesn't really make sense because we know for a fact that the sun gives a perfect black body spectrum just like this, actually. The sun is a perfect rainbow. Maybe you've taken a, maybe you've just seen, uh, you've been spraying a hose in the summertime washing your car. You'll see, or, or you've seen a rainbow, for instance, right? <clears throat> sun gives off all of the different wavelengths in this perfect intensity pattern as a black body. Now, there's also, you can also detect some gas lines on the sun, and that's from its atmosphere, which we call the corona, um, and the chromosphere. There's, there's, there's an atmosphere, a gaseous atmosphere for sure, but there's something really interesting and solid-like about the sun. And, the interpretation of Kirchhoff's laws, which I'm going to go through for you, uh, is really at the heart of the discussion about what the sun is comprised of. You know, I think that the more modern conception of the sun is that it's a plasma, right? Maybe this is what your textbooks have said. But it's still considered to be a gaseous plasma because, of course, the gaseousness of it is what allows for the fusion mechanism that people understand in the sun today. Um, but this is in, in, in really stark disagreement uh, in my own analysis of this because, of course, the sun doesn't behave like a gas at all. And it's quite obvious you can take, like I said, go look at a rainbow. It behaves very much like a black body. Now, Kirchhoff recognized that, um, you know, his first law is a hot, solid liquid uh, emits radiation at all wavelengths, a continuous spectrum of radiation. Um, and later on, Kirchhoff was persuaded uh, by, to the idea that if you had a sufficiently dense gas, that it would perhaps also radiate in a continuous spectrum. Although he never really did this experiment himself. He just sort of accepted it because this fusion mechanism was so tempting. You know, people were trying to figure out how the sun was powered, how it generated all of its heat. And uh, prior to the fusion idea, which was really championed by this dude, Arthur Eddington, uh, people were really thinking that it was just something like a, a gravitational heating, right? And we see this on, on bodies like Jupiter. They're very large, and as they compress, it's sort of like a piston in an engine. It generates a lot of heat. But uh, this didn't, uh, this was never observed, right? He, ne he never was able to actually see this. And in fact, no one 
to this day, has ever been able to generate a sufficiently dense gas to generate a black body spectrum. So there's some mystery about the sun. There's something else going on. Um, and, you know, I think that the best evidence for that is like, well, if fusion needs this gas mechanism to explain the sun, how is that fusion stuff going right now, you know? How's that technology going? You know, every once in a while we'll get, get a headline in the news that the fusion progresses. We made a huge jump in our understanding of fusion. Actually, these headlines that came out last year were, were really perplexing because they were like, we've achieved net positive gains of fusion. Did anybody see these headlines? Nobody saw this? You saw it? Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's cool. But when you start reading about how these experiments were conducted, what you actually find out is that the, the energy that they needed to, to power the laser to get this plasmatic gas to undergo fusion uh, it was, was hundreds of times the amount of energy that they received. What they really mean in these net positive reports is that the actual burst from that gun uh, contained slightly less energy than the output from the fusion. But it's, it's in no way a, an actual uh, promising technology in any time in the near future. And, and so my sense is that if we don't totally understand how the sun does its fusion, um, maybe reconsidering the material basis of the sun is a good place to start because the sun certainly doesn't appear to be anything like a gas, um, although we model it that way in modern astronomy. So, anyways, this is our sun. It gives a beautiful continuous spectrum. Um, the second uh, uh, law of Kirchhoff's uh, thesis is that a hot gas in front of a cooler background emits radiation at a discrete set of isolated wavelengths. These discrete isolated wavelengths are called the emission lines. This is kind of his work with Bunsen, because if you pass it across a prism, you see isolated lines of different colors, different frequencies, different wavelengths. The whole spectrum is called an emission line spectrum. Um, and then the third law, which is quite important, is that a cool gas in front of a hotter solid or a liquid background removes the radiation from the background source at, at those same specific wavelengths. So in the case of our sun, if you put an atmosphere around the sun, which we believe it has, you actually will absorb, those gases will absorb that radiation and not transmit it as well. And so you get these little black lines across the solar continuous spectrum. So the sun is, a, and, and all of the stars are, are wonderful tools because we can get the temperature from the continuous spectrum, and we can get the elemental composition of their atmospheres from the black lines, the missing bands across them. You can also, as, as planets, exoplanets, say, pass by stars, we can get information about their atmospheres by how they screen that light as well, which is pretty cool. So those are, those are, the, uh, those are the three principal uh, discoveries which really all of modern astronomy is based upon. Um, the, the fourth law is, is something like uh, an atom which absorbs at a particular frequency also will emit at, a, at a, the same frequency. And this seems to be the case, right? The, if, you, if you burn those elements or, or you excite them, you're going to get the same lines as if you shielded them, uh, as you use, use them as a screen in front of something like a star, something with a continuous spectrum. Now, as we move towards understanding telescopes and how we actually make use of all this, this light that's coming into us, we have had a lot of trouble because our atmosphere, just like I explained, the atmosphere of the sun absorbs certain frequencies. Our atmosphere absorbs almost all of them, actually. So this is a nice diagram of, of, the, uh, of the absorption of different uh, wavelengths by our atmosphere. And what's really, really cool is that we only have a, a tiny window down here in the visible spectrum. This is the whole frequency spectrum of light. And, and our atmosphere is actually very much impervious to these short wavelength lights. And that's super important because, you know, if we're getting bombarded with gamma rays and so forth all day long, our biology wouldn't have stood a chance. It's also remarkable that, of course, our eyes evolved to deal with this little window of light that we do receive in the optical spectrum, right? So 
it's, it's no accident that your eyeballs see in this range because that's the primary range in this you know, mid-range energy that we're able to get down to the, to the surface of the Earth. That's what we can see with because that's the only kind of light that penetrates down here. There's also a little window of radio waves that penetrate to the Earth, and that's why we can use radio waves uh, because, like I said, they don't, uh, the, the atmosphere between me and the people at the back of the room isn't you know, getting, it, it's very good at relaying visual information and radio, inf radio information. So this is, in some sense, a, a happy accident, but you know, there's no real accidents because we, we, of course, evolved on this planet and we adapted to what we were given, which is these circumstances, and they've been quite productive. So I will, <clears throat> I'm gonna crack open a little bit about the basics of a telescope before we start, but we'll pick up with the history next time a bit more, um, because there's a really fascinating story I wanna tell you guys about uh, the development of modern astronomy, because most of it happened, modern astronomy, with these big telescopes, happened during World War II, and what's really interesting is that all of the men were off killing each other in World War II. And so a lot of that work was done by women who didn't make it into the, into the history books. And there's a really fascinating story about that, uh, which is captured in a book that I want to uh, show you guys. But let's look at uh, telescopes, how they work. So you basically have uh, a big bucket that you have to catch all of this light in. That's called your aperture. Uh, the aperture is then used to focus the light with another lens. And then, of course, you have some sort of uh, detector, which is usually your eyeball in the case of if you're going to go look at the stars. But there's other ways of doing that, um, which we'll see very soon. So, um, and and this, this is very much uh, a, a square law process, because the intensity of light is a square law. So a telescope that has you know, a, an aperture of, of four meters in diameter can collect 16 times as much as one that has a one meter diameter. Um, and you might, you might think, well, when did people start using uh, lenses to focus things, right? And actually, it was quite a long time ago. Um, there was people playing with eyeglasses as early as the 1200s, you know, uh, still kind of coming out of the Middle Ages in Italy. Uh, this, this guy, Nicholas of Cusa, who's a real, real beast of philosophy and, and physics and science, in 1451, started using concave lenses to correct nearsightedness. And uh, it was actually another couple hundred years before anyone thought of putting two of them in front of, of one another in order to, to approximate anything like a telescope. And so there was some sketches made. Uh, Bacon um, made some sketches. Leonardo da Vinci made some sketches of a potential design for a long view uh, series of lenses. But neither one of them seems to have actually produced that uh, prototype. And, and perhaps that's because their glass making, their access to glass making was not um, top notch. It seems to have been the Dutch actually in the 1600s who decided to actually start manufacturing these things, um, these telescopes, because they, they could be quite useful for navigation, as you can imagine. You guys have all seen like the pirates with their looking glasses and so forth. So Galileo then came along uh, almost immediately, I would say like within three years of the invention of the first telescope, Galileo had bought one of these things and started fine tuning it. And they were, the first telescopes that were manufactured could only see maybe 3x magnification. And Galileo fine tuned that up to something closer to 30, I guess 20, early, like 23x magnification, I guess was Galileo's telescope. And uh, Galileo actually gave it the name telescope. And very quickly, uh, people began turning these to the sky and making really interesting uh, drawings. So uh, Christian Huygens, who gave us, in some sense, uh, a lot of the work that we, we glossed over with regard to the wave nature of light. Um, also, one of those guys who just had his fingers in everything, you know, he, he was uh, working on optics, mechanics. Um, I believe that he worked in civil service to some extent. But he built this kind of preposterous telescope, as you can see it. He actually hung the, the primary aperture up uh, on this huge tree, or whatever this is, a post, uh, and, and ended up standing quite a ways away with his lens in order to make these drawings uh, of Saturn. And this is the first time that people realized that Saturn had rings. You know? And I think that was really astounding to, to people at the time. And he made these drawings of Saturn. He also was able to see the moons of Saturn for the first time. 
which was quite perplexing. And, you know, the discovery that all of the other, uh, these wandering stars had their own little systems about them really reinforced for people the idea that the Earth was part of a bigger system that centered around the sun. Because, of course, it was sort of a, a theoretical conjecture put forth by uh, folks like uh, Copernicus and Galileo. It was, a, it was a, a nice idea that perhaps simplified uh, the very complex ep epicycles that were from the Ptolemaic model. But it really seemed to make sense when you started seeing other bodies with things rotating around them in a plane, right? And so this was uh, of no small importance to really understanding our own place in the solar system. Now, there's a problem, though, with telescopes. Um, and the problem is the same uh, wonderful technology that we've used to split light into its different wavelengths. And the problem is that, you know, when you relay light through a material, um, you know, not so much through the air, although it does happen in the air, especially, um, especially at long distances, what happens is that the different colors of lights, they interact with the molecules that they're being relayed through uh, differently. And so what you have is you have the prism effect. And actually, you can see this, um, to, to some extent, you can see this at sunset, right, when the, the sun appears to get red because those different, those redder wavelengths are being bent down towards you from across the horizon. It's going through all, you know, you think about it. At, at midday, there's only a thin layer of atmosphere between you and, and outer space. But when you see the sun at the horizon, you're going through that whole shell of atmosphere to see it, right? So there's a lot more atmosphere that's, that can participate in this refraction business. And so that's what's happening here. Well, it turns out this happens in, in any glass lens also acts very much like a, a refracting device. And so the problem is that when you're trying to look at tiny little sources of light and you're trying to magnify them into big areas, you actually get all sorts of what we would call dispersion, right? You get the wavelengths separated out. And the result is that it's a very blurry image. You know, perhaps you've watched a sunset, too, and noticed that the sun gets very blurry, right, before it goes down. This happened with telescopes as well. And so, what was the solution to this? Um, there's a couple of solutions. Uh, people started making these things that they called corrective optics, right, where you basically sandwich a concave lens on the back of a convex lens, and you can sort of correct these, these deviations as they occur. But... A simpler solution is actually to use a mirror instead to, uh, to grab up all of the light that you want to focus in on. Now, mirrors have this advantage that they don't refract the light. You don't get this chromatic aberration from them, this dispersion of different colors. And so most of the telescopes that we're going to be dealing with um, next time, when we get into these really huge telescopes and how they work, they're almost all mirror-based. Um, there's more reasons for that, too. You know, if you try to make something out of glass that's really big, it, it, it gets heavy really fast. And as it gets heavy, it sags and bends and distorts, let alone can crack in half, right? So working with big, per, like trying to perfect a huge piece of glass is very, very difficult. It's heavy. It's difficult to transport. It's very hard to point it at things. And so people moved away from... Uh, from these uh, basic refraction uh, type scopes that were popular in, in the early days, and they moved into these reflector types where you collect all of this starlight at the back of the scope, reflect it uh, basically through a series of mirrors onto an eyepiece. And this has proved uh, extraordinary in terms of being able to make really large uh, collecting uh, areas, right? And there's a number of ways that people have perfected that, which I, I think that um, we'll get into a bit more next time. Uh, this was, of course, one of the very first early 20th century telescopes, enormous things. And, you know, here's, here's a mirrored telescope. This is from the, uh, one of the biggest ones in the world, uh, which is very uncreatively named uh, the Very Large Telescope. <laughs> uh, it has a, a mirror that's a little over 8 meters in diameter. Uh, oops. Here's another one. This is the Palomar 5-meter telescope, 8-meter uh, telescope, Gemini North. Um, now, one, one of the ways, what, what you'll see in a lot of these telescopes that are based in, in outer space, too, in particular, 
is that uh, in order to get around the fact that things distort, I mean, you put something on a rocket ship, you send it into space, it's going to be a very violent experience. And of course, once you're out there, it's very difficult to negotiate uh, any changes that might take place. So the way that they've gotten around this, uh, the fact that these mirrors are subject to deformation too, right? I mean, glass is heavy, mirrors are less heavy, but still, they can be, de be deformed, and that's a real problem in terms of trying to collect the light in a concerted fashion. So what they'll do is they'll divide them up into these tiny little panels that are hexagonal. And each one of those little panels can be uh, coupled to an actuator, a little robotic arm of some sort, and they can actually change uh, the, the orientation of those and correct for them as they might deform or distort under different pressures, which is pretty cool. And um, that's been really useful because actually using those, even if you don't do those telescopes in space, you can do them on Earth. And what you can do is you can actually measure the different, because uh, our atmosphere, of course, like I said, it distorts things. That's why these telescopes are always built on the top of mountains and stuff. You want to look through as little atmosphere as possible. But, you know, this image uh, here of Jupiter is actually made from Earth. And the way that they make such a, if you, if you for instance, go out uh, to one of these uh, astronomy nights and try to look at Jupiter, um, even if you have a really, really, really good telescope, it's going to be a pretty wobbly image because our atmosphere can't help but, but do some of that refraction business and mess with the light. So the way that they've made these really killer images is they use those uh, hexagonal tiled collecting uh, mirrors and they actually are able to take information about the atmospheric wander and, and t teach uh, the computer to move the mirrors in such a way as to cancel out the individual wobbles of the atmosphere. This is called adaptive optics, which is just really high-tech version of doing it. Of course, the best way is just to go to outer space, but that's rather expensive. Um, this is one of those adaptive optics. You can just see this, 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 it's just a mess of cabling and, and hydraulics and so forth. So what I want to pick up with next time is the story of spectroscopy and, and how, who the people were that actually figured out um, th that we had all sorts of different stars and they actually were in different moments of their lives and how they made sense of that from, from the very stars themselves. But I want you guys to, as you go out into the world, I want you to, to really uh, try to not take light for granted and, and really think about what's happening between you and the person that you're looking at and how your eyes are actually able to touch one another and do this process because uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that field. Otherwise, have a good week, and I will see you Thursday.